Hello, everyone, uh, on Hausa, on Facebook, on Periscope, on Downer, on Dasher, on Blitzen. <laughs> We're multicasting from everywhere. I am your host, Lauren Gray, for this week in hospitality digital marketing with my ever present co host, Mr. Robert Cole from Rock Cheetah. Hello, Mr. Robert. How are you doing, Lauren? I am good. I, I, I actually feel good about the technology today. I, uh, I got everything kicked off and redone and synchronized, like synchronized swimming. I have all three players starting at the same time. Which, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm getting this somewhere close to being controllable. This which is, is good. good. After 18 months, one would hope that would eventually occur. So. Uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, the pain is the truth. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. <laughs> How's your week been so far? Good. I have been keeping busy, most certainly. So excellent, excellent, yeah. excellent. I've had a fun, fun week myself. Uh, to, for a recap of today's show, I, 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 from what I understand, it's always best to for because uh, I'm doing the translations now on the show, so that the text box runs on the bottom of the show, uh, and yeah. it says that in order to get an, a good first capture of people watching on Facebook Live, talk about what the show is about first, so that it it texts that at the beginning, so people may want to continue to watch. Excellent. So uh, today's recap is we're going to talk about uh, fun, whatever the hell we want to, on anything we want to talk about for whatever we want to talk about it for. No, actually, uh, <laughs> we talk about tools, news, and techniques associated with hospitality, uh, digital marketing, only for hospitality, digital marketing, and we keep ourselves focused on that. And to that end, I send a whole Pandora's box of news features out this week. And I also have a tool I want to share that I, I talked about on last week's podcast, which is a... Um, to make cinemagraphs. And um, if people aren't familiar with that, we'll talk a little bit about it, but it's a way to uh, make one for free, which is always the best price tag to have if you uh, like playing with that kind of stuff. It gives you some uh, interesting visualization tools. Are, and they Mr. Anything, Edward, are they anything like Cinnabons? Oh, I wish they were that good. I do. I wish they were that good, but no, no. This is this is uh, <laughs> what we'll talk about. I want to keep it as a big That's surprise. Okay. It's actually a really cool tool because um, if Ed was here, Mr. St. Orange from Flip2, he would just be rolling his eyes like, don't let the masses have the tools. They don't know what to do with the spaceship. Have a professional fly it. you know. And I'm kind of like, no, no, give them the keys. What can they do? They can just wreck it. What could go wrong? Yeah. What possibly could go wrong? <laughs> <laughs> let me see if I can adjust my camera a little bit so it's not. And uh, there's a little bit of an echo. Oh, is there? Okay, let's see what I have on that's still around. I might because I'm doing the podcast the uh the live show on the uh um same computer i'm doing facebook on the same computer that we're doing the house of presentation because i periscope on the other one it might be causing a back uh audio how bad is it well let's, well, see. let's see it's about it's a one about second one delay second. for me okay i'm not hearing it too bad on my end so probably because i'm doing all the talking right um <laughs> okay so I actually threw into the agenda item something that was for Mr. Tim Peter, who apparently has decided that he can't join us. Actually, I think he mentioned last week. Oh, no, until, I think until um, 11 or something like that. He said oh, thanks, he'd Eric. be a little bit, little bit late. Oh, okay. Okay. Well, we could save his little topic of Amazon Go till he gets with us because uh, that he, oh my gosh, his podcast, he, he, he interrupted his normal broadcast, which was a series on content development, simply to go over and talk about Amazon Go and how he thinks that's the best thing oh. since sliced bread. Yes. <laughs> he, and for anybody that doesn't know, Mr. Tim Peters with Tim Peter and Associate, um, he does a podcast like I do a podcast. He's on episode 182. Uh, I'm on episode 132, actually. Uh, but I did have other podcasts before him, so I get to, to, to rub that out every once in a while. But, but if you do uh, through a week, you can catch up really quick. That's true. <laughs> yeah, that'd be just just what I need. Yeah. More fun time doing live shows. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Eric, hey, by the way, Eric, thank you again for joining us as always. And we never got a chance to talk when we're in the Phoenix together. Do you feel like, do you want to join the show for a little bit? You want to pop on? You got a camera? I mean, since we are waiting for Tim anyway, we could always use a third pretty face uh, or at least one pretty face and the rest of us. Two of us. <laughs> <laughs> Two of us. Well, <laughs> the other thing is I, you probably didn't see, I added another topic with um, some Morgan Stanley research on Airbnb, Ooh, which is very... That very insightful stuff. Do you want to wait until we have another audio, uh, another participant in our conversation or do you want to throw that out first? Oh, we might as well throw it out first. Because oh, let's do it. Let's, it's, let's, big, let's, let's, let's. it's big stuff. Okay. okay. So Morgan Stanley obviously tracks a lot of 
equity um, re- does a lot of equity research. So they follow internet stocks, uh, which Airbnb would certainly follow fall into that, um, as well as the Expedia's Priceline online travel agencies. They also follow hospitality shares like you know, Marriott Hilton, as well as real estate investment trusts. So this this particular one was focusing on um, a tracking study that they're doing um, on Airbnb and basically who's Airbnb impacting. So some very, very interesting, these guys are asking absolutely the right questions, which I really wish I've got to go talk to the focus, right guys, about asking these <laughs> sorts of questions on a tracking scale across a, a, a larger span of, a, of the industry. But okay, so starts off with traveler penetration. Um, last year when they did the study, Airbnb had 12%. Basically, 12% of leisure travelers and 12% of business travelers had tried Airbnb. Um, this year it's now 18 and or I'm sorry, 19 and 18%. So 19% of leisure travelers and 18% of, of business travelers have used Airbnb at least once. So that's a pretty dramatic jump of, wow. in terms of, of penetration in one year. And they expect it to rise for both groups next year to 25% for leisure and 23% for business. So that's a doubling of usage. What? Now, again, that's within two years. That's, that's still pretty astronomical growth, even on in the 24 month program. Right, right. So that, and again, this isn't just, oh, we're adding a bunch of units out there in Buenos Aires or Johannesburg. This is people who have tried it at least once. Okay. So you go, wow. And on the business side, notice business is very close. Yes, leisure is outpacing it. But I think if you ask most hoteliers um, what it would be, they'd say, oh, it's all leisure. There's no business. No, it's right now it's about 50, 50. Yes. Leisure will outpace it a little bit, but it's still, sp- still pretty dramatic. Now, the other question though is, okay, well, that's people who've tried it. What about awareness? Right? So last year, awareness of Airbnb was 50%. This year, awareness is 75%. Wow. Ooh. Wow. Okay. By the way, I think just so everybody knows, the gray square that just joined us is Eric Dorr, but I don't think Eric has a camera, or at least the camera's not. Eric, can you hear us? Yes. <clears throat> yes, I can. Excellent, Eric. Thank uh, you so Eric. much for joining us at last. I'm sorry, we no interrupted problem. you. Mr. Robert, I'll work on the video. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Most excellent. Robert, I'm sorry. That's, that's, a thought. that's a thought, um, Lauren. You know, perhaps if we lost the video, maybe viewership would go up. Uh, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Actually, yeah, maybe, maybe. maybe. But, you know, I actually, but okay, now I will ask this as a consensus. I'll ask this as a question. I'll do this on the posting as well. I was thinking about splintering the audio of our show off. Now, I do a podcast every week already. I try to keep it about 20 minutes, max 30 minutes. And there is a recap of the show in there. And I just kind of hit the highlights of our conversations mm-hmm. uh, after I do the, the minute notes for the show. But I just didn't think there would be people that wanted to listen to an hour and a half, two hours, hour of the audio, but if you're, you know, who knows? Cause it is a fun dialogue. I mean, people might want to listen to it in the background. Who knows? I'd, I'd love for any people's right. insights. If there's anybody has an opinion about it, Eric, yours included, uh, please let me know. Cause it's easy enough to split off and uh, throw into a podcast and make it a parallel. So That's anyway, great. Okay. well, back to the Morgan Stanley stats. Um, so we talked about penetration. So penetration is up in terms of actual usage or, or experience with the product. Awareness is up, you know, 50 percent higher than last year up to 75 percent of people are now aware of it and then the big question is user satisfaction well last year it was 90 percent which is pretty pretty damn good this year again okay you you have to imagine the numbers are going up more people are using it so you'd imagine okay maybe the shine's starting to wear off a little bit no satisfaction's up to 93 percent now wow Wow. Now, la- last so week, pr- those are pretty powerful, pretty powerful trends. They're huge trends. Now, last week, we didn't get to get to any of the news features that we had thrown into the queue because we had our time with that. Uh, so we'll Alex cover today. them all today. <laughs> yeah, so we're showing them in today. It's yep. daily news. <laughs> uh, but one of the articles was about what Airbnb's grand strategy is. And uh, it was mm-hmm. a Skift article. And I had a chance to review it in the podcast. And um, it really is a, a scary perspective of, of Airbnb 
uh, in, the, in the larger grand scale. First, you know, they, they, like the article was saying, first, it was no big surprise that they're getting into the tour operator space and the ancillary Absolutely. services. It makes sense because they're trying to create that that connection of destination value proposition. But then it kind of raised and, and monetization for the hosts. Yes, and monetization for the hosts. Yes, and then but then it did raise eyebrows when they got into the car rental, airline rental or airline uh, sales space. Because then now what you're talking about is is this a new breed of OTA? Are they looking to be instead of the provider of going to someplace, the provider of getting of being there? But you know, kind of like a, right. a, a reversal of the perspective of saying we're going to provide all that you need within one ecosystem. Uh, from the from 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 our platform, rather than you having to rediscover and discover what all connections you need to create through this process, Eric, we have been talking over you this entire time, and we had the pleasure finally <laughs> to get you on the show with us. Uh, please, what what do you feel about all this kind of stuff? We're kind of throwing some things around. Um, <clears throat> I, I think it's um, it's definitely going to impact. Um, it's starting to impact Phoenix more um, than it had before. It was you know big city centric i thought but um recently um i'm hearing more and more uh, out here in the valley of the sun and in smaller areas like um even denver and such that it's start, starting to ripple through now down to these you know tier two tier three cities yeah. by the way for people who don't know eric door um is based out of phoenix he is the president of the hsmi chapter out of phoenix which i had the pleasure of uh, joining uh, well, what has it been now about um few weeks ago two or three weeks ago i got to see him briefly you were a busy man you you were there but then you disappeared you had to take <clears> off i was to grab yeah. a beer with you after all the time we got to spend on the show together and you, you ducked yeah. out on me yeah <laughs> Actually, uh, I, I flew out and i'll be uh proud to announce i'll be joining the uh team from intelity right in in ed's backyard in orlando intelity oh. mobile tablet uh uh, joining Greg Hopkins and and uh, Jennifer Rando and, and team over there, and I start on the seventeenth. Cool. So I had to fly out for for that and 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 begin the interview process. And um, easy to say, it worked out, and and uh, I started in a couple of weeks. So excited to kind of take it for um, you know take the next uh, several years with Intelli. So and that's a, a great team, and Greg's a really smart guy. Did, yeah, 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 did very uh, now, well yeah. with his last venture. So. Question to ask: Have you ever lived in Florida before, or tropical, tropical temperate thing? You know, compared to uh, no, no, I'm I'm used to the dry heat, and uh, so, but I have family in in the Tampa area, uh, but no, I've never, never, never lived there. But uh, you won't, yeah. you won't have to check your shoes for scorpions, but you might check the backyard for gators. <laughs> <laughs> I was just thinking about off, the. Uh, <laughs> The different perspective. High text down there. Yeah. <laughs> That's the only thing I was worried about is the different perspective. Because for me, I was like a kid in a toy store when I was going through Amarillo, which of course is not out in Phoenix, but the same, you know, temperate. When it was super dry and super hot, I was trying to put the squeegee on the windshield, and I was I was just like a kid because as I'm putting the water on the windshield, it's so dry it was evaporating before I could flip it over to do the squeegee, which doesn't happen in Florida. Florida is usually like. You're part of the squeegee. <laughs> you need the wipers on all the time. You need the wipers on all the time for it. So just curious about it. But anyway, all right. Well, very good. Hey, one, one, yeah, one, one last comment on that is um, we had overall consensus from our chapter. We just had a leadership retreat uh, here in Arizona. But um, one of the innovative ideas that we have come up with and we need to kind of put some thought to it is bringing the Blabcast and, and the, this week in hospitality digital marketing uh, live but streaming from our chapter potentially in February or March time frame huh? and uh, so we'll work out the details but we'd love to have you all all you know three or four of you and and maybe Holly could uh, you know moderate or something like that since she's out there um, and we'll, we'll figure out the details but um, we're look we'll be coming back at you for potentially bringing the show on the road so although awesome. although if we do that Holly will have to stay backstage the way she always does here <laughs> <laughs> Although she is the queen of fact checking, if anybody can check our facts, Holly yep. first does it. She's the one that keeps us straight in line. We know we do not go off fact checking pace with her. Um, That's right. you know, Hotels are going to run full next year. Oh, they are. I'm sorry, Holly. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yes, and actually, uh, with HSMI, there are some other additionals. Uh, HSMI is getting on more on board with our show. Um, we're going right. to have a scheduled participation from all of the board and council members uh, over the course of the uh, upcoming 2017 season where uh, we will actually have a revenue uh, council or revenue board come on for a revenue session where they might be two or three of them because I guess they want to have strength in numbers. Um, and also two from marketing, also two from sales, and of course the digital council and so forth. So we're actually going to have scheduled participation because I, I kind of was stomping on my feet a lot that we do this for the, uh, the purpose of improving HSMAI's content. 
yet very uh, it's very challenging to get a lot of participation from the boards and councils. Because of course they're 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 busy people, and it's 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 an additional effort to try to be on on the show and take the time to do it. But it, it looks like we're going to get that, and they're going to start featuring us more in their newsletters, and um, we're going to get our own web page on the HSMA site. Woo-hoo. Great, that's Woo-hoo. awesome. So, yeah, and uh, okay. we might we might uh, we might try to do the roadshow. And, and Eric, if we work, we'll, we'll do Phoenix first, guaranteed Phoenix first. Right. One of All the right. ideas we wanted to have was we wanted chapters to be able to join in where we could have a camera facing the whole chapter, and they participated exactly. in the process. So mm-hmm. outstanding! I'm glad you guys have thought of that, and that we will be able to do that with you all. That'd be awesome. Excellent. Thank you. Right. Wow, we have a bunch of people on Periscope. Hey. Holy crap! Sorry, we'll I just there you go. I'm getting all these little heartsy things on Periscope, and we're doing pretty good. We yeah, nice. Um, hey. well, okay, back to Morgan Stanley because there's back, more. Back at the ranch with grandma beating off the Indians. <laughs> I'm still, tr- I'm still trying to get this thing down to an arrow, Lauren. <laughs> Boom! <laughs> <laughs> Good luck with that. <laughs> so, okay, just to recap where, where we left off was 75% of the people, um, now are aware of Airbnb, 25% of them have actually tried it. And of those who've tried it, 93% really like it. So pretty, pretty daunting numbers. But then the next obvious question is, well, so people do who's losing? If Airbnb is winning big, right. well, 49% of Airbnb users are substituting away from traditional hotels. And that is up 900 basis points from last year. So the guys and and yes, Airbnb has done the kind of hey, we aren't a competitor. Don't you know nothing to worry about here. These are not the droids you're looking for, type thing. Um, which is exactly what Travelocity did when they started. I, I'll never forget Terry Jones standing up in front of one of the last Saber World conferences, which was this massive trade show, you know, rah rah session that Saber would help and and with a straight face, basically tell all travel agents that Travelocity was not a competitor. And it was like, really? Wow, that was pretty gutsy. And uh, and they bought it, you know, wow. sort of thing, which um Well, which hey, was... look at our current political system. We'll buy anything these days. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah. So this is not a new, this is not a new approach. Um, yeah. So um, while still small, here's the assessment. We believe Airbnb has been almost double the threat to hotels in 2016 than previously believed, and the threat is growing. So, now, isn't that in designated markets? Though, I mean, that's been part of the argument is that the 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 real Airbnb threat is not just it is not global or not general. It's in specific markets and it's in specific seasonalities of demand. Is that I, is that just smoke and mirrors that I, they've been throwing up? Uh, um, yes and no. I would say you've got to look at Airbnb the same way that you look at the quote millennial market. Um, you know, everybody's like, oh, you've got to market to millennials. Do it. Well, is it's turning out? Most people are kind of realize, yes, millennials are a little bit different than, you know, older generations, things like that. But everybody pretty much wants the same sort of thing. Yes, millennials were the first ones, certainly on Facebook, but now certainly boomers and that sort of thing have, have adopted Facebook and droves where actually millennials have maybe even fallen off a little bit on the platform. So they're early adopters. And so with Airbnb, something like that, it's what early adopters want. What Airbnb is providing are authentic, unique travel experiences where you have a high degree of hospitality, which means host guest engagement, which is going back to the the fundamental underpinnings of, of hospitality itself. And most of that really came from after they hired Chip Connolly, who really gave them the, the hospitality focus. The other thing you mentioned was going into other sorts of things and diversifying very, very smart strategic move for, oh, yes. uh, for Airbnb. Um, Expedia had their partner conference this week in uh, in Las Vegas, and what did they come out with? Some research, which was the oh shit moment of seeing it on paper, going, "Wow, people travel for experiences and doing things in the destination. Who knew?" It's it's like right, you know, the hotel people are not traveling you know across the country to stay at the Super 8 at the north end of DFW Airport, as nice as the property may be. I have never stayed there, but, you know, that's not exactly it. They're traveling there for some other reason, and they need a place to stay, right? Yep. So, um, as we said on the last show, 
yeah, my my big point now is the differentiation of hotels and the ability to get, you know, premiums in terms of rev par, in terms of higher occupancies, in terms of greater ADR comes from how far you want to differentiate yourself from a lodging mini storage warehouse mm. <laughs> sort of thing. You can just put people in there overnight and do like, yes, we are we are doing we're providing temporary shelter for you to we're really providing a great experience and helping your travel travel be better and more memorable and just generally having a, a greater sort of time. So um, since we don't get the privilege of having your presence so much on this, what do you think about all that? Um, I was just one thought that just came to mind was I, I know from um, sitting on a couple other conferences that there, there are some um, free tools and reporting or some tools out there and I don't know exactly how to achieve them, but uh you know, perhaps we can we can uh, post a link there. There's, you know, area by area reporting uh, from Airbnb that's, you know, helpful support on, you know, um, for those hoteliers and, and venues that uh, want to really get a get a sense of what what's what's happening out there. But um, I'm sure you guys have, may have talked about this in the in past cast before. I don't know. We, we have. Yeah, but you know, it wouldn't be a bad thing to go dig them back up. We, we threw some links up. Uh, this goes back a few months where we threw up some Airbnb track links where it showed Airbnb right. inventory in the market and. And what the actual inventory was based on type, and um, uh, Price Waterhouse did some stuff with that for a while too. I think Robert that they they, they made some tool functions on that. Um, yeah, the, um, a good one's Air DNA, which is Air DNA. Yep, Co. Um, they they're pretty much the leader. I will I will post the link. Um, Robert, you're so good with that, man. It's just like the fingertips. Me, I gotta go like, oh crap, what was the last shit on that one? I gotta go dig that <laughs> <Yeah>. up. <laughs> yeah. Thank so, you. So no, and they have they have some good data, but still the problem for that is with Airbnb, you have dynamic supply. So you can look at it of like what's going on right now. But and Airbnb is being much better at providing better tools for for the hosts, similar to a way that Expedia with, um, you know, their their partner center really helped hotels understand what was going on. I mean, it was revolutionary when um, Expedia started producing reports that the hotel ears could go into and go, oh, here's how I stack up in the sort order damn my, my rates are too high well what did that do had an immediate effect at these hotels trying to boost themselves lowering rates and doing exactly what you know expedia that, that would want me. to do to generate more businesses provide better value for the traveler and then it, the selling part's easy i sent a love note out to edward while he was out uh, doing his debacle in uh, expedia land and vegas mm -hmm. this past week i wanted to find out more about rev plus it's an open platform of revenue management yeah. tools now <laughs> for wow. hotel years um, that goes beyond just the optimization of your inter intranet relationship with Expedia. This actually, you can do revenue management on all channels with them. Uh, and I, I'm really curious whether it's just a reporting tool, but not a functional connectivity, or is it also providing connectivity to channels? Because if that's the case, now you're turning into the land of meta search connectivity. And, and that opens up a whole other realm of, holy crap, if Expedia starts regulating that and having the data from that, that changes the game landscape for them as well. So, well, I'll, I'll tell you a, a little story from oh. twenty from twenty years ago. Oh, wait, 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 is this <laughs> wait, 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 is this when you were Four Seasons? No, it wasn't. No, oh, but was it's just after you left Cornell. You left Cornell. No, it wasn't. It was well after both of them. <laughs> 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 Sorry, so, folks. For those who are new to the show, we always well, have to I, mention Four Seasons and Cornell. If, if, if it's like a shot game, though we're not drinking. <laughs> but so, but some watching maybe. Yes. <laughs> so, shot time. <laughs> so so in well about nineteen years in around nineteen ninety seven ish we put together a strategy for for Sabre, um, which unfortunately wasn't adopted due to the. Um, no, I can say it now. The ignorance of the CEO at the time, who yeah, who bastard. didn't really didn't really <laughs> think hotels were that big a thing. Oops. Yeah, and <laughs> so, Yahoo didn't think that the uh, the brothers were doing quite well with their search engine either back around ninety eight. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, but in at this point in time, we were looking at at certain acquisitions and things like that. And one of the things we looked at was Pegasus, um, and we we did a fairly deep dive. And uh, discovered we did not want to buy it because they were only doing about $10 million a year in sales um, from the switch itself. And vast majority of their revenues were coming from commission collection, you know, sort of thing. So I um, didn't like didn't like that business model. So but 
what we just what we were going to do was not to go into too many of the details, but vertically integrate the GDS platform that Saber had very robust and fast and reliable, um, which did not have really any database to speak of. It was very, very poor. So we actually wound up doing a deal with Hyatt and their Spirit Central Res System, nice Unix-based database to kind of handle the CRS level. That never really got developed, although that deal was done. And then third was to acquire property management systems to vertically integrate. And we looked at acquiring a, Oh, Micros Fidelio, which we could have gotten at that time for about mm, a tenth of the cost that Oracle wound up paying for them, but didn't didn't wind up doing that. They had cash registers, things like that. So basically vertically integrate that. But the strategy was, um, as you bring up MetaSearch, and we didn't certainly didn't call it MetaSearch then, was we felt if we could vertically integrate that and get the core data of the hotel, the true deep rates and in inventory, that then we would provide, if you have access to that, then you can share it to others for free. You don't charge them because that's your data and, or you have kind of for, you know, first usage of that and you know the core deep information. If you expose that, that's great. And then all of a sudden, boom, Pegasus winds up becoming completely inconsequential because why would you pay them to do this? Right. You just put your stuff in Sabre and it goes out everywhere. Give it to Amadeus, give it to, you know, which people thought was, oh my God, we would never want to give them the information. It's like, oh no, if it's your information, you control it and you're the point where they're loading it and you are part of the DNA of that, that hotel, then hey, you, you win. So fast forward 20 years, What's Expedia doing? What's Booking.com doing? What are a variety of the groups doing? They're trying to become part of that underlying DNA, either by providing websites, by providing revenue management tools. The key is how do you get that underlying core data, the deep, you know, the deep web content, which drives all of those web pages, the core unit by unit, room category, rate plan type stuff that, yep. that drives the industry how do you get access to that and, and if you to, have it on your platform natively then everybody wins say goodbye to the great but eric you're leaving us okay borrowing a laptop hey. to the, to the time <laughs> hey listen thanks yeah. for dropping in for the time that you had hey no Wait, problem really, just uh, the first time yeah yeah i'm gonna be i'll be back for sure i'm uh get that that new laptop here in a week and uh i appreciate the time to you guys i'll, I'll stay on listening but um uh, the phantom, the phantom remains. The gray box is leading. And, uh, uh, well, and Rob, I keep on plugging, man. I love it. If you're, if you're, consi if you're considering buying a new laptop, oh, no. you might consider <laughs> the surface. I think he's going to get one because of his new gig. I think he's getting one because of his new gig. Yes. Right? Oh, yeah. oh, the surface. Yeah, yeah. You got the it. Microsoft Surface. The Surface Book is very cool, very expensive. Well, welcome to this week in hospitality digital marketing and barter. <laughs> Sp Thanks, sponsored guys. by, by, by Eric. <laughs> sponsored by groups who aren't paying us. <laughs> sponsored by groups who are not paying us. Hey, yeah. uh, that brings up two other aspects to it, and this were new items, news items that we didn't get to last week that can carry easily over to this week as well, which was C Trips purchase of Skyscanner, uh -oh. which we didn't talk much about. Right. And of course, uh, Airbnb uh, settling uh, its uh, New York lawsuit and all trying to be pretty, pretty and nice with the, uh, uh, hey, you know, we're, we're, we're here to support cities. We're not out to Dover and take money out of your pocket. We're happy to talk about taxes and all this other stuff mm -hmm. to legitimize their relationship with the cities. Well, that we should, we can just, let's just cover that one real quick. Sure. I mean, that's inevitable. And Airbnb has yeah. realized that that's been inevitable for 24 months. I don't know. So, Yes, they they want to they want to pay hotel taxes when it is a full unit rental and it's be and the unit is behaving like a hotel, and that's great. And they want people to be safe. And no, they don't want to have all of the various rules that apply to hotels apply to a person's individual apartment because that's nonsensical right and then that's certainly been where a lot of the lobbying by h and la and some really ridiculous counterproductive stuff has been has been going on um so no if you just take a rational approach to it that's <clears throat> that's good and you even look at what some of the cities are doing um i can't remember who it it might be new york um or maybe it was boston i can't remember i read an article that they want to take the the fines 
and then allocate that to affordable housing, right? <laughs> so the people who cheat, you know, basically put it, and that's the real key for Airbnb success is to really be conscious of, of undermining affordable housing in these cities because that is their Achilles heel. If they kill these communities and these cool little neighborhoods by turning them all into quasi hotels, mm -hmm. then you basically destroyed the cool, the cool thing of why, why you should exist. Right. Mm -hmm. And I don't, I really don't think those guys are, are looking at this as a short term. Let's ramp this thing up and exit and make it for it. I think they're really looking at, this is a movement. This is highly yeah. disruptive. How do we do this and not screw, you know, screw things up in the process? Well, and, it, and, it, and it goes back to an underlying conversation I had with some clients that are in the limited service field, limited service hotel field and so forth. They feel that mm -hmm. Airbnb is, is nothing for them to be concerned with, that it's a destination based right. interest that people yeah. that are using Airbnb are for the experiential uh, I'm traveling to enjoy myself. It's leisure based. I want to experience things. I'm not there for sure. functionality. And, and and the contrary is very true. It's like, no, dudes, wake up. This is if you, if you think you're a little factory of, uh, you know, heads and beds and rates and, 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 and occupancies. That's exactly what Airbnb can provide as well. It's like, look, I just need a place to gotcha. crash. I need it to be in, in a reasonable location, reasonable cost. Even a better location. Yeah. Right. Because you can not right into the, the zone. Right. Yes. Right. And, and well, and when I was, I'll, I'll bring up another old company, Journey's End. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, what we did very radically in 1989 was we built a 105 unit property about a block from the New York Public Library. So it was 40th and 5th Avenue. Um, very tall, slender tower on a, a small portion of land as a Carlisle group project. It was great. We made front page of the New York Times, you know, Sunday real estate section because it was brand new construction. And at that time we opened up at 105 bucks a night sort of thing. It was really cheap. It was new. It was a great, it's now the courtyard. It's the Marriott courtyard, I believe oh, Okay, um, down there. So it's a great little property, but it was really inexpensive because we were stacking motel units vertically in urban locations. Yep. Right. And that, you know, people didn't really do that before, but it was, it, it made a lot of, uh, a lot of sense, but for all those economy properties, it doesn't matter if you're out at the airport or whatever, you need to be very concerned about Airbnb because it depends on if you're, are you a first fill property or are you somewhere in the middle or are you down at the long tail somewhere? And if Airbnb is, you know, siphoning off demand, um, those full, you know, full days are going to be fewer the stat oh boy i don't know if i have this stat l2 um scott galloway had a great had a great statistic on the number of sold out dates for hotels or kind of peak occupancy periods and i don't have the underlying um stat, but anyway this year down dramatically versus last year and mm. that is not a good indicator for the hotel industry because this year's occupancies are are a little bit off of last year, not much. I mean, we're talking, you know, maybe, you know, less than a point, but that plateauing of kind of maximum occupancy, when you start getting around the 70% mark, um, that's a problem. So all of a sudden you're going, wait a second, those peaks where we could really have some nice, aggressive, you know, rate growth, things like that, those are disappearing. Right. So they the, shaved off the top. And, and yeah. And the, and the EBITDA, the bottom line, the last thing on the Morgan Stanley thing is that they their forecast because of this this research is that they're lowering lowering their lodging EBITDA estimates by one to three percent and the price targets accordingly for their stock. So all of a sudden, if you're taking you know one to three percent off of the bottom line of hotel profitability in a period where you have record rev par all time historically high rev pars, it is watch out for the next downturn. Yeah, because it's going to get ugly. It's going to get fast. And it's going to go deeper because yep. they're not. And this this goes back to marketing strategies. As I'm building them for some clients and so forth for seventeen, they're blind eyeing the the impact of what market strategy they have for this dilution of demand cycle that they. Whoa, there's Mr. Tim. Hey, fellas, how are you? Hi, hey. Mr. Tim. We saved your 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 uh, your your favorite topic for when you got here, uh, which is the Amazon Go, which I know you 
you you changed your entire broadcasting program for your podcast simply because you were so excited about it you had to <laughs> interrupt your entire series. But anyway, so we're talking about Morgan Stanley. I, I don't, Robert had some great stats. I mean, he, he can recap for you real I'll, quick. I'll recap know. very, very quickly. So Morgan Stanley's stats on Airbnb. They've been doing tracking year over year. Mm -hmm. So started off that with awareness of Airbnb. Last year was 50%. This year is 75%. Hmm. How many people have used Airbnb? Last year was about 12% and equally split for um, oh, both leisure and business travel. Mm -hmm. So 12% mm -hmm. had actually used it. Um, this year, up to 19 and 18%, which is a pretty dramatic growth. Next year, forecast to be 25 and 23%. Wow. Actual, that's usage at least once, right? Yeah. So that's actually trying the product. So I have a question about that specifically. And I don't know if this is clear in the data. I've not seen this data before, but uh, um, are these of people who are frequent travelers? Are these people who are travelers? Is this of the, you know, a representative sample um, of the- I'll have the, to look at the sample. Um, I think it's general travelers, I believe. General travelers, okay, yep. okay. Uh, so, so then you go to, well, what's the satisfaction? Obviously usage is increasing, things like that. So last year, um, the satisfaction was 90%, which is pretty damn not, high. Not terrible, no. And with all this growth, you'd, uh, you know, I think I would assume, well, it's going to drop off a little bit because you got people trying to go, well, it's not for me. No, it's 93%. So it's going up. <laughs> so, okay. Well, they're okay. doing something, right? So, well, they are. And then the question is, who's this coming from? And they said, oh, what do you know? 49% of Airbnb users are substituting away from traditional hotels, up 900 basis points from last year. I'm, I'm hey. shocked, shocked to hear those numbers. Yeah, yeah. Here are your so, winning, sir. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. So this overall sorts of thing is that um, updated room night analysis, Airbnb proves to be a 90 um, oh, um, BIPs drag on RevPAR in 2016. Um, and that's more than they thought it was going to be 50 basis points, you know, last year. So it's almost more than double, right? Or it's you know, 80% more, more impact. So the bottom line is their EBITDA estimates for hotels are down one to 3% and their price to, they're going, this is a direct hit on EBITDA. And so that's, you know, and, and, oh, sorry, Lauren, we didn't cover off. How does this, hurt, who does this hurt? Yes, it hurts hotels. So they're saying underweight groups like IHG and what are they overweight Priceline Because this is Priceline. not impacting yeah. OTAs at all. Really? Yeah. <laughs> Maybe helping them. So, he's yeah. been saying the whole time the whole time it's like yeah this whole direct thing yeah go ahead you, you guys have fun with that <laughs> yeah yeah so again the ota channel okay ota user penetrated again this this is just such great great stats sorry to geek out a little bit here but ota user penetration is at 56 percent now it's going to fall a little bit they think it'll fall to maybe 54 percent you know that that sort of thing um but this is far better than the expectations of users using hotel websites. Right now it's 55% penetration, right? So about the same as OTA, expected to fall to 46%. Tim, we're gonna have to ask you to leave the, the show because my Periscope audience went down since you joined. Sorry, it's just, it's. <laughs> Oh, sorry. Well, hey, thanks, that hurt. <laughs> no, oh, wow. now it's back up. Obviously, Pro humor is a key. No. <laughs> Proving yet again, as yeah. I've been told many times. Well, and, they, and, made for radio. And and then, it's funny. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the last, just a couple more stats, guys. I know you're tending to wander here, but this is <laughs> this is critically depressing stuff for the hotel industry. <laughs> So then the other stat that, of course, masks all the hotels going, hey, things are coming online and this is great. And look at our online penetration. The hotel call and walk-in demand was 34%. That's expected to fall to 26%. So when you have a drop like that, yeah, 
the people aren't walking in, they aren't using the call center, but where are they going? Yes, they're going online. So that's kind of artificially going, hey, look at what's happening. Well, that, those aren't new travelers. Those are just your same guys coming through a more efficient channel, which is great. I mean, that's that's a good thing, but really different than what's happening with the with 21 the percent. Or so, it went from 34 percent to 20, 26 that's a big, oh, well, uh, so anyway, they said basically the OTA channels are are resilient. Second, the OTAs are continuing to build out their non-hotel inventory, which they yeah. think that that actually gives them maybe an advantage over Airbnb. Because if you have yeah. all the stuff, then it's like, well, good, I can go there. Airbnb is just going to give me this, and then I got to go to the hotels mm -hmm. just for that. I'll just go to an OTA, get both. And then third, the search marketing expertise and sheer ad dollar spend, which is about $7 billion, um, is, is a difficult barrier for anybody, including Airbnb, to, to you know, take over. So basically, they're, they're overweighting. The bottom line of this is they're overweighting groups like Priceline. They're underweighting the hotel brands. So um back last well you know, that's encouraging yeah and they they haven't they haven't really come out i mean last summer they were kind of like we don't know there's a 33 percent chance that the otas win there's a 33 percent chance the hotels win there's a 33 percent chance there's a price war and then all hell breaks loose um they don't they didn't really know um i think they're starting to figure it out as we right Right. As we were mentioning earlier, um, that when this this downturn happens, as inevitably as we discussed, it does, uh, it's going to go fast. It's going to go hard. And there's going to be a lot of people that did not have the contingency of marketing strategy with the the uh, what would you, I guess we say project creep, but the market creep of demand where Airbnb right. is going to infuse. And I did ask Robert before you joined us, you know, it always has been a, a statement saying that Airbnb isn't as pervasive in all markets as it appears to be. It's primarily in specific destination markets, and it's also leveraged to seasonal high demands. Is that just a smoke and mirror of these aren't the droids you're looking for mentality? And uh, and, and Robert has, has been disproving that with these stats saying, no, actually, it's a prevalent issue that isn't based on those kind of things. It, it, it can be influenced by those, but it isn't driven by those. And right. in fact, you have to consider your inventory dilution in market and the market demand for what you're not providing. And as and then this also got inspired from the Airbnb article we didn't get to last week, which was what is Airbnb's grand demand? And it looks like the way they the, the article was a skift article. It talked about how it was no big surprise they got into the tour operator space and the ancillary services and so forth and to improve the model for the, ho the host. It did raise eyebrows of them getting into the car rental and air transportation section and now is airbnb getting into the potential new generation of ota where they're the ecosystem service provider from the recipient's point of view not the, the provider's point of view it's a reverse of the, well, not reverse but a, a a a coming at the model from a different angle kind of perspective it was an interesting perspective on it i thought well i i posted a couple links over on the on the chat um you know i haven't done this in a couple of weeks so i figured it you know it was due that's right we already got cornell and uh, four seasons in the conversation so we're already done two shots <laughs> not mentioned by go. me <laughs> there we go all right so so uh but uh, there was a post i wrote back in august um that that really came from an interview that joe gebbia did um uh, joe gebbia co-founder of airbnb uh where he was talking to skift specifically um, and you know, he really talked about the fact that they really see themselves in the hospitality business. You know, I'm, I'm reading a quote from Skiff that is in the blog post where he says, we didn't come up with anything new. Hospitality has been around forever. And there are many websites like ours. Why did ours eventually take off? Luck and timing aside, what I've learned is we can understand the components of trust and design for that. Mm -hmm. Trust is still and will always be the foundation of our company. And one of my main objectives has been to find new ways to understand and innovate all aspects of trust in our service, our company, and our community. Right. Now, if you ask me, that sounds a lot like providing a good hospitality experience. It is. Well, I think it's two. No. I think it's two different things. I think those are two of the foundational pillars of Airbnb. One right. is is Gebbia and those guys figured out really early that yes, if you're going to stay, particularly in their original business model before the pivot, of staying in somebody's house on an airbed, 
Yeah, right, right. right. <laughs> which was the original right. which was business the original model, business. was an right. air bed, right? It was Not a separate right. room. It was right. like you're in the right. living room right. sort of thing. That yes, trust is critically important yeah. for this, right? Yeah. The second one though was the hiring of of Chip Connolly, who right. brought in the hospitality dimension, right? right? And then I would argue the third pillar was their investment, their investors who brought adult supervision <laughs> to, oh, sure. how to, how to oh, really sure. strategize well, this and grow this, and and certainly the cap cheap capital to go you know make this global. Well, and I mean, I certainly agree with the third, and I, I don't mean this to, to diminish that in any way, uh, but to me, the third is table stakes in the sense that, you know, the best strategy in the world, if you can't execute, you know, all you are is a really good idea, you know, um, and, and, you know, we talked to uh, Alex from Alice last week, you know, and a lot of what they're focused on is how to help hotels execute more effectively because if you don't do that well it doesn't matter who you're competing against you're going to lose right you're gonna, you're going to fail so in this specific case i i certainly don't want to diminish the importance of that but but to me execution kind of is part and parcel of anybody doing it well i think that where they've been really smart is in addition to executing well is being focused on you know I mean, how many times have we had this conversation on this show that the hospitality industry has increasingly become a real estate play? Mm -hmm. And so what you run into is that, you know, there aren't great operators, you know, because the, the, the focus becomes less about the operation and more, less about the experience and more about the, the how do we yield, how do we yield an extra couple of bucks per square foot out of this box? It's yeah. actually getting back well, to the design of new hotels. I mean, it used to be old hotels, and you can tell the difference between working, being in an old hotel that was built, I should say, at an earlier time, not an old hotel, but an earlier time, versus the new hotels where the maximization of square foot yield on revenue is paramount. There used to be a back of the house. There is no back of the right. house in new hotels. That everybody, right. the, the staff is is operating in the very clean view of of the guests, and that is yep. so much against the old way of doing things. Where uh, like you got maids carts into the elevators. Yeah, it's always it's like, a great experience. It, it, it used to be <laughs> that, 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 that you had a back of the house, you had a back hallway for catering, you had a back hallway for service, uh, housekeeping, and so forth. That people would magically appear and take care of everything you need, just like Disney. People would pop up and take care of things, and you didn't know where they came from because it was a right. whole another world that existed around the world that was being created for you. And that has gone to the wayside, saying, "No, that's just wasted space." We need to maximize our square footage. We're going to put more rooms in. We're going to have less service space. And it's taken away service quality. You, it's no fun having a cart. You got to work around with your wheelie uh, suitcase because they're in the hallway. I mean, right. so yes. Well, point. actually, actually, I'll, I'll tell another I, old story from that since I love to tell old stories. <laughs> um, involved in the in the redevelopment of the... Um, Oh, the St. George's Hospital project, which nobody remembers St. George's Hospital at Hyde Park Corner, but it's now the Lanesboro Hotel, right? So oh, yeah, when, I know when that sure. was being redeveloped, had a little bit of a problem um, in the way that they laid everything out. Number, number one, um, there was no area for like purchasing and receiving. It wound up being way the hell away and that, that wound up being okay. But they had a lot of interesting structural columns and they had a nice, um, nice elevator core. And there was basically a three and a half foot gap between what was going to be a downstairs, their, their meeting space, which wasn't really big, but it was kind of in the basement on one side. And on the other side would be the kitchens, but in between was the elevator, you know, basically for the service, you know, service going up and down for, for everything for the service staff. And, a structural column three and a half feet away. So all the traffic of the wait staff and food and everything having to go con right to one little, very, very constrained space was very interesting how to deal with that, with that. But now, you know, and actually that was always a problem with that, with that property anyway, to operate it because they couldn't really blow up the structural walls, but 
you know, yes, they worked, they worked around it, but, um, you know, that's, that's something that used to be very important of not having stuff cross the traffic that you didn't see right the back of how, I mean, certainly you look at meeting space and things like that and people setting up and you've got all the service staff in there rolling stuff out and setting up in the middle of things that used to happen from how did you stage all of that, uh, all of that flow in the background. So there was a, a door at the end of the corridor and they could just come down and kind of set the stuff up and then go there and not mm -hmm. cross anything else. Well, and that, that part of hotel development is gone. <laughs> well, we had Basically. a conversation, we had a conversation years ago with, uh, um, one of our hotels, uh, one of our competitors actually. Mm -hmm. And, um, th since we're playing bingo, this was during my time at leading, <laughs> But it was it was a competitor of some of our member hotels, so luxury property, uh, well known brand, et cetera. But I'm gonna I'm gonna uh, you know hide the names to protect the guilty. And um, oh come on, give us a give us give us some clue. You can give us a room count. You can give us a, a city and <laughs> no no it was a chain. It was a it was a luxury chain. So uh -huh. uh, uh, but it was somebody who was a, a you know a big partner of the chain, one of the major developers who owned a number of the properties and the like. And our chief marketing officer at the time asked this developer because uh, he was talking all about how they maximized yield per square foot. I mean, it was very straightforward and everything that they did, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And our chief marketing officer said, what about um, intangibles like brand and you know experience and service and things along those lines? And his response was one of the most telling things I've ever heard. And he said, Oh, that's easy. We pay for those with intangible dollars. Uh. <laughs> uh, <yeah. clears throat> that's a good one. Uh, yep. Yeah. That and it was like to the uh, performance hospitality days where uh, when they were in that huge acquisition mode and they were swallowing up so many hotels, uh, buying up swaths of hotels back in the yeah. mid to late 90s. And the uh, acquisition crew who was being paraded around in their like a victory square, like they were going to hotels and you know, like, oh, we just bought this one and welcome to the team and so forth, was caught. And this is before social media, so it couldn't blow up to probably the level it should have been. As they're walking through the hotels, it was overheard by the staff that was all very proud to think they're joining a big organization. They're all dressed up, they're lined up. Remember the days we used to do lineups? Uh, and they sure. walking in and one of the, uh, the team that was being w walked in was overheard saying, where are we? I don't know, one of those bum fuck Town, towns or something like that. What hotels? I don't know. Who cares? And it got overheard by the staff. And that got spread around. It's like they, it was just turned into this. We don't care who it is. It's just assets. Right. It's just buy this, buy that. Right. And it really it turned into a big scuttlebutt within the organization. Look, two years after that, Performance Hospitality was dissolved because they basically got recut up by other organizations that carved out of them because they didn't operate well. They didn't operate for hospitality's sake. They operated as a, as a property ownership group. And they couldn't understand right. why hotels that they bought that were successful after them buying it went into this downward spiral because they were cost saving themselves out of, <laughs> out of service. And it's like right. they were trying to they were trying to shrink their way to greatness. Yes, they yes, they were trying to cost themselves <laughs> profitability. Yeah. Yes, yes, all that yeah. good stuff. Yeah. Uh, well, hey, hey, we benchmark. We use the F word today. I did anyway, so that's good. Well, <laughs> so, so my my one my one comment on that, and you know, this is a conversation we've had a number of times. Look, I don't want to knock people who are asset managers. I don't want to knock people who are in this as a real estate play by any stretch. That there is value in that. There's merit in that, and the like. What I would say is, you know, if you're a real estate investor. Uh, you know, and you keep buying hotels, hoping to yield the most out of the real estate by cutting costs or things along those lines, you're better off investing in part in apartment buildings where their owners are going right. to put those assets on Airbnb in a couple of years, because that's where you're driving yeah. those customers to anyway. Parking right? garage and where you don't have all that labor cost. And where you don't have all that pesky labor cost. <laughs> right, right. No, exactly. Parking garages. Parking garages are incredibly profitable. <laughs> yes, that's right. uh, yeah, but wait till self-driving cars come along. That's no, no, that's no, 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 no. I still maintain mini storage. Mini storage. Self self storage. Self storage. That's there it. you go. <laughs> and 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 in the states where this is now illegal, weed farms. Weed farms. Yeah, I, right. I'm investing in, in. Yes. Anyway. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so, but yeah, no I mean, you can invest in. I think it's a great investment. Anyway, uh, there we were with the Airbnb part of it. Also, um, we jumped over to. Uh, I, I was telling Robert at the beginning of the show that 
because we had Alex on last week, it was such a great conversation with him. And we got so delved into what, what Alice was all about and the service models and so forth that are represented. We didn't get to any of the news items. So I recapped them in my podcast from last week. And I, uh, I invoked my, my inner Robert on one of the articles, which was the new iteration of Marriott's classification of their branding. Yes. And the segmentation of what differences between the, uh, distinct and luxury and, and, and I, I equated it a little bit to anytime a company takes over another company, their first thing they say is, don't worry, we're going to keep everybody and nothing changes. We just right. want to mm -hmm. meld together, which is really saying in doublespeak, you know, we don't know what you do yet exactly to know how we're going to replace you. So until then, we don't want you to leave us before we know how to do that. So we're going to tell you to calm down until we figure out how to replace you. And I went on this little angle on how they're going to have to reabsorb branding, brand saturation and market and so forth. But I'd love to hear you guys continue thoughts on yet the nether storyline from Marriott about how the brands are going to be able to coexist. And they have made the next step, which is, well, these ones are over here and those ones are over there. Yeah, that's your way to be happy. Yeah, so. So maybe we should recap what this this little amalgamation <laughs> looks like and how, how they've stratified these various right. various uh, groups. Okay, so they've basically taken their 31 brands, um, very similar to Baskin and Robbins flavors. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but still. <Maybe> somebody. <laughs> Marriott, the, they started with their hot shops, so they're just going back to their roots. You right. want to do a screen, <laughs> we do a screen share on the, on the infograph that they made, or you just think we want to talk it through? Oh, yeah, you can do that. Yeah, that's that's fine. Their little building, yeah, one building with all this stuff. Yeah, in. the one building so with they, the division in between. Yeah, so they basically separated classic from distinctive. Are two? Think of it as an Excel spreadsheet because this is how it was obviously worked out. <laughs> right, right. So, right. <laughs> so you have the columns are classic and distinctive. Um, then the rows are luxury, premium and select right so when you when you start going through these um it's it's very very interesting because basically they made six categories um with a couple of other little ones thrown in that would like for longer stays and, and things like that but right, right with with this they basically kind of figured out how to shoehorn in all their brands into these categories and right. the, the relationship between them, it really doesn't sort out a lot of things where you say classic is Ritz Carlton, St. Regis, which arguably, yeah, okay, those, those are a little bit more traditional than W or addition. Um, mm -hmm. But then you start looking at these little aberrations like, well, JD. Um, I've lost, uh, Robert's Robert? audio. Uh oh, Robert, what happened, dude? I shared my screen and you disappeared. I, do you see the screen up, Rob, Tim? I see the screen, but I don't, I don't have Robert. I don't Robert. know why I would lose Robert. I'm here. Right. Am I back? Oh, there you're, you're back. back. Here you are. Here you are. This, must um, been, this must have been the delay. Sorry about I that. Had, no, been. I had to, actually another Huzza thing. Um, I had to reinstate my camera and, uh. And oh, weird. No. microphone for some so when you screen shared it basically knocked knocked me but it knocked my, my authorization to do it oh. which i don't know but that's odd. Yeah, but no, Tim stayed. anyway please i'm, yeah. I'm sorry so, we got so anyway so here's so okay so i thought when i first read the article it kind of made so actually one of the telling things was of how well this laid out was i believe the reporter not to malign hotel news now which i lo i love those guys but i believe the reporter who covered it confused the categories <laughs> <laughs> when, they, when they wrote the story, there were some inconsistencies. I think they started saying premium instead of distinctive or something oh, like sure, that. Sure. And uh -huh. which is very, because all of these words are completely interchangeable and they have almost, no, I mean, premium versus luxury versus select. It's like, those are three different terms, but I, I think you go out and ask consumers what that means. And it's like, I, I don't know. I, don't I, also, know. I also would tell you, I, I think the Ritz Carlton folks in particular, and probably the St. Regis folks, yep. are probably a little perturbed because I certainly don't doubt that they think that their design and their you know service and all is classic. I think they would also argue it is distinctive. So, right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. It's, oh, so it's not distinctive. <laughs> right. Exactly. It's, it's not necessarily the best choice of words in the history of 
right being but but again i think if you go and look at oh if i can find the marriott page where they break down all of this stuff hang on i mean even if you said you know instead of classic and distinctive you know uh a traditional and 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 uh, uh more modern or something like that yeah but, something. But, see, but they run into accurate, real you know and again i i don't uh, yeah the the job that that Tina Edmondson has at Mar this is a nasty, nasty branding issue because they're obviously getting input that do not kill any of these brands. We do not want to lose any of the portfolio that sends a signal that this didn't really work out as well and things like that. And there should be a culling of the herd, right? In this. Oh, I lost him again. <laughs> Robert, I'm sorry, dude. I went off the screen and you disappeared again. I'm sorry. Uh, but again, to Robert's point, as he joins us, I'm sure, in just a second after he reinstitutes there, there the other. And I had to sorry. reauthorize. That's another little interesting huzzah thing. But, Tim, but yeah, but Tim is fine. You're not. And, and it's weird because you were, anyway, yeah. Uh, I'm sorry, you were going. I, you were I paid okay. the huzzah bill. No, yeah. I don't. <laughs> exactly. I don't. <laughs> okay, so so here's here's what so basically all of these groups are now into they have two categories. So if you talk about Ritz Carlton, they are classic luxury, right? And right. if you even go to the Marriott website and go through all of these, you go, okay, so what's their description? Legendary service creates experiences so exceptional our guests can return simply by closing their eyes. What? Huh? What? That's the that's the description on Marriott's webpage of Where'd their brand. That? That's on their it's website. On Marriott's. I'm not. You can't make this stuff up. What crack smoking marketer made that bullshit statement? <laughs> okay. Okay. No. no. Okay. So that <laughs> so that's the that is the positioning <laughs> statement for Ritz Carlton, right? Oh my God. Okay, Cesar Ritz, yeah, they borrowed pie. his name, is is going, what? <laughs> what? Right, 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 right. Qua? <laughs> so, Qua. <laughs> so, St. Regis, okay, <laughs> is in the same category, right? Classic luxury, where exquisite, immersive experiences, impeccable service, modern indulgence, and refined taste define every stay. So you don't have exquisite experiences at at oh, no. Ritz, no. obviously. It's not immersive at Ritz. There's not impeccable service. You don't no. get any sort of modern indulgent. And but if you close your eyes, you'll remember you're there. Yeah, yeah, that's good. Right. So, and and you and you look at the pictures. Oh, also you look at the pictures, right? So Ritz Carlton has actually it's a really horrible like pork kosher or something like that which is in, in China, it's a really bad picture for Ritz, which is, is very sad. Um, it shows a pretty modern guest room and then it has a pool, right? You know, with, with some uh, oh, little, you know, day beds and things like that. The St. Regis, what they show, they show the port cocher of the St. Regis in New York, right? right none of right. these, yeah. none of